All right, welcome back to Metplex and Chill. This is Rachel Gregory, your host, and I'm here with my good friend, Kristen Rao. How are you today, Kristen? Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Rachel. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you back on for a second time. Um, so before we get into, well, today we're going to be talking all about detoxes, which I'm super excited about. Um, so do you want to give our listeners a little bit of your background? Tell us like who you are in case they haven't heard the first episode, which if you're listening, I'm going to link the first episode we did. I forgot what number it was, but I'll link that in the show notes. So anybody who hasn't listened can go and listen to that after they listen to this episode. Um, so give Perfect. us a little background on, on you, who you are, how you got to where you are today. Awesome. So I'm a functional nutritional therapist and I own a business called Energetically Efficient, which I founded in the summer of 2019 after I went back to school for nutritional therapy. So I have an odd background in coming into this profession because I was for nearly 17 years, a business litigation trial lawyer practicing in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I was in court all the time, having a lot of depositions, mediations, oral arguments, trials. So what I'm doing now is obviously totally different. And the short version on why I changed careers is in, I think it was like 2016 or 2017, I hired a meditation coach and started meditating for the first time because I was reading all sorts of information about the fact that the most successful people in the world meditate. And I felt like just given my stress level as a trial lawyer, it was something that could really help me de-stress and calm my system. So I hired a meditation coach, started meditating, and the short version on how I got here is it really was like a calling for me to change careers, and that happened sort of over the course of 2018 and then 2019 when I finally chose to leave the practice of law and start my business. So what I largely do now is coach one-on-one -on -one clients um, each day. I also run nutrition courses. So I'm running currently a detox course right now. I'm on personally day five of my detox course, which is pretty fun. So it's nice timing that we're going to be able to talk about it today. And then other online courses and um, yeah, all the things. So I really love what I do. I get to work from home. I get to be with my two golden retrievers all of the time now, which is awesome. I know you're a relatively new dog mom, so it's really fun. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. And also you are a badass marathon runner, right? And also bodybuilder. So do you want to give just a quick background on like your experience in that realm? Just because I feel like that's a very unique, you know, you don't see many marathoners and bodybuilders. And that's why I think you have such a amazing background. Yes. So share a little bit about that. And then we'll get into all things detox. Of course. So um, I have run 25 marathons and it sounds crazy to even say that out loud to me. I ran my first marathon during my first semester of law school as a way to sort of figure out how I could keep out, keep up with working out and stress management while I was in law school. And then I just got the bug and I started to love marathoning. So I have run 25 of them and I was intending to run another one. And then COVID hit because I'd love to run 26 marathons since the distance of a marathon is 26 yeah. miles. I kind of want to run 26, but whatever, we'll get back <laughs> to those someday. And then what happened in 2013 is I actually fell on ice in Williston, North Dakota, broke my leg in 10 places. And so I obviously couldn't run for a while. So what I started to do more of, even though I had strength trained, I started strength training in the gym when I was 14 years old, but I really started to get more intense about my strength training after that. And what I found was I had the ability to put on a lot of muscle when I wasn't running a ton and marathoning all the time. So I noticed that I was putting on more muscle and um, fast forward in 2017, I did my first bodybuilding competition. And then in 2018, I became a figure pro in bodybuilding. So I did run a marathon and do a bodybuilding competition in both 2018 and 2019. And people think that's crazy, but I really, it comes down to the intention about each workout. And I just have a mesomorphic build where I tend to retain muscle better. But I also, if I train hard, I can be pretty fast. So I ran a 319 for my fastest marathon. And then I'm a IPE figure pro bodybuilder. So cool. Thank and I can you. see your trophies in the background. If you're watching this. Um, they are. So awesome. Yes. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get into um, kind of, well, I guess maybe just like, let's start with, cause this, we're going to talk all about detoxing and it's something like I mentioned, I haven't had anybody on the show yet kind of talking about this concept of detoxing, like what it actually does and how it can be powerful. Um, maybe there's maybe talking to some of the 
the gimmicks out there that might not be so powerful, like th th things like that. And I think it's just a topic that a lot of people are just confused about. Um, yeah. So maybe we can just dive into kind of like what, um, like what you've learned both with mm -hmm. yourself working with clients um, in terms of detoxing, and then we can maybe dive into like what your protocols look like and, and stuff like that. Perfect. So detoxification, you're right, is a huge topic. And I think it's something that people don't understand a lot about. So I guess I'd start from saying that I did my first detox diet in either 2000 or 2001. So I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And at the time I did a detox with a friend. We were curious about how it might improve our health. And we read this book about how detoxification could be beneficial. So what we did and what I've continued to do each year since then, and what I recommend is what I call a real food detox. So I don't recommend these five day juice cleanses. I don't think anything like that makes sense, at least for me personally. And I don't recommend that for my clients because as you know, in terms of nutrition, when you take out all the fiber of fruits and vegetables, you create a juice and it tends to be more carbohydrates and sugar. And I just think consuming nothing but carbs and sugar for five days is a bad idea. So I don't recommend that. So the detoxes that I do are, are for this purpose, Rachel. I always tell people our liver is our hardest working organ in our body. So our liver is literally like our filter. If you think of the filter on your heating system or the filter in your car or the filter on anything, you wouldn't go the entire life of that thing and never clean it. So a detox is really a cleaning for your liver. The other thing that a detox does is it cleans your large intestine, otherwise known as your colon, which is effectively the second hardest working organ, I'd say, behind your liver, whereas your liver is your filter system, your colon is your plumbing system. And those things over time truly get gummed up with toxins. So we are inundated with toxins all the time. So that might be from processed food that someone ate, that might be from alcohol that they drank, that might be from sugar they consumed, it may be from undigested food because they weren't digesting their food really well. It may be because they have small intestine dysbiosis and they've got a, a clogged liver and clogged colon as a result. But these things clog over time. The other toxins that impact everyone is the air that we breathe, the creams and lotions we put on our bodies. I mean, all of that stuff, our liver filters all of it. So I think it's a really good idea, at least on an annual basis, for people to engage in a real food detox that really gives their liver system some support and love and heals it and really gives their colon the support they need. And I will tell you, the difference that you feel from start to finish on these detoxes is pretty incredible. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that, so like personally, I haven't, and this is like after we finish recording, I'm probably gonna be like, let me get in your course right now. <laughs> um, because I haven't done one in a while. I have, you know, I don't know, I can't really remember, but I did play around with some detoxes like years ago. Um, really like in my mind, like when I look to like detox or kind of just like settle down and, and all of that, it's fasting, like doing extended fasts. Um, sure. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that, but I do want to kind of dive into your like protocol. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about it? You said it's five days or... So mine is two weeks actually. Two so weeks, I'll talk okay. about mine. Yep. So mine is two weeks and that's what I recommend. So it's a combination of several different detoxes that I've done over the years that I've kind of come up with my method that works the best. So for the first week, you're eating certain kinds of foods in certain categories. And then there's a bunch of foods on the no list. And then in the second week, you're essentially doing the same thing, but then you're adding back some friendly bacteria in the form of friendly yogurt, like probiotic yogurt or sauerkraut. So I'll just give you an example of what we're doing that first week. The first week is, and this is seven days. So this time I started my detox on a Monday. So from Monday to Sunday, I am not eating any dairy, any gluten, any soy, any grains of any kind, any processed food of any kind, any alcohol, no caffeine. That's probably the hardest Ooh. part for people. <laughs> people freak out when I add that, that, point. Um, no, no mold, which I know sounds weird, but like an overly ripe, uh, ripe avocado where there's brown spots on it. That's actually mold. Mm -hmm. So you can't have that. Um, nuts and stuff uh, have mold. So yes, nuts do. You're right. So you could have a little bit of nuts, but you have to be careful about that. It has to be sourced really well. Mm -hmm. So those would be the list of the no products. So okay. soy, gluten, dairy, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, or 
sweeteners of any kind. So here's what you have to eat each day, these in certain categories. So one, we wanna have categories of our cruciferous vegetables. So our Brussels sprouts, cabbage, um, broccoli, cauliflower, those are the primary things in that category. Then the next category is we have to have something in citrus, orange, lemon, or lime. The next category is the dark leafy greens. So this is your kales, your spinach, your arugula, your Swiss chard, dandelion greens, mustard greens, all of the sorts of weird greens that sometimes we don't touch when we're at the grocery store. I always yeah. encourage people to consume those. And then there's a sulfur group, which is really healthy for your liver, which is eggs, garlic, and onions. And then there's another liver healing category that I always say is sort of the random category of liver healers. And that's things like celery, asparagus, beets, artichokes, whey protein, which is awesome, that whey protein is in there, dandelion root. So I always recommend dandelion root tea. And then you move to the colon supporting category, which is all the things that you would think are very fibrous. Mm -hmm. Apples, berries, carrots, pears, flaxseed, psyllium husk, those kinds of foods. Okay. So, and then we have the lean proteins and then healthy fats. So the main thing about the detox, and this is really interesting for all your ketogenic low carb community listeners, because obviously I practice that largely also, a detoxification is really a lower fat two week plan. So you really only have about three servings of healthy fats during the day. My fat comes way down when I do a detox. And the reason is this, our liver is what processes all our fat. Mm -hmm. So during that two week detox, we're actually giving ourselves a break and allowing our liver to heal and to recover and to have some support. So we really aren't eating a lot of fat during the detox. And then I'm of course incorporating protein all the time, but I've been looking at my macros for the, for this week and they're just so different in terms of what I normally yeah. eat. What are the, so I have two questions. I want to ask about the way, but in terms of macros, so like what would be like, like what's your average day been like? So my average day has really been like a, almost more like a zone diet, like a 40, 30, 30. And for me, because you know me, I love protein. It's really been more like almost 40% protein, which is kind of a lot, but I'm keeping my calories at about maintenance calories, which for me is 1800 to 2000. Okay. So I'm sticking right around that range, but I'm doing more like 30% of my calories from carbs. So on my net carbs on chronometer, I'm typically seeing around 120 to 150 a day which would okay. be normally one of my carb ups, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of my regular diet. So I'm doing that pretty much every day, but, but I really like the way I feel and I wouldn't want to do it long-term, but it mm -hmm. is good for a reset. Yeah. It is good for a reset. And then in terms of whey, cause I know you said whey was part, was one of those. So can you just actually maybe um, just talk to, cause a lot of people get confused with whey protein powder as well. They're like, oh, whey is dairy, right? They think it has yes. dairy in it. Can you just talk to the point to, to that point? And then also to the point of most whey protein powders do come from like, well, at least the ones on the market might not be super high quality and there's like other fillers and sweeteners. So can you talk to that point as well? Of course, because it's really important, especially if you're doing a detox, because you want to have all crappy sweeteners out of your system. You can't have anything that includes sucralose, for example, or of course, no maltodextrin. So it's really important when you choose a whey protein that it's a whey protein isolate, that it's got as clean of ingredients as possible. And I hear from clients a lot, well, I'm sensitive to dairy or I can't eat dairy, so I can't consume whey. And so I say, well, that may be true. Whey may be something that irritates you, or it may be that you were having a whey that just wasn't a high quality whey. And so you can purchase high quality whey proteins on the market that literally, even though technically whey would come from a dairy source, it doesn't have any lactose, mm -hmm. right? So there are several like that, that I recommend. Uh, typically I'm having my clients use either the ascent whey protein, even though that's okay. isolate in a little bit of concentrate, but it's sweetened with monk fruit. So that's obviously a super clean whey protein. Mm -hmm. Biotics, which is a brand that I highly recommend. It's a really clean whey protein. And then I just learned of a new one that I have not tried yet that I ordered, and it should be here this week called X-Works. It's out of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It's just an X and then W-E-R-K-S. A friend of mine tried it and recommended it to me but it's okay. all grass-fed beef whey. They have no lactose um, and it's got no sugar and it's only got two other ingredients, I think, which is like monk fruit and, and maybe a thickener. That's it. Okay. And then in terms of like uh, monk, so sweeteners like monk fruit and stevia. So is there any um, reason to cut those out 
for? Yeah, great question. So you can, I always say, if you really feel like you need stevia or monk fruit in something on the detox, like in a tea and you want to add a sweetener to it, you can. Stevia is okay. Monk fruit is okay. And I try to encourage my clients to break the addiction to needing sweet all of the time, just because it really makes, I think, at least I've found this in my personal experience, and I've known this for other clients, it becomes that issue of hyper palatability. So I want to retrain my brain to have strawberries and raspberries and blueberries taste super sweet. And you don't get that as long as you're continuing to dump monk fruit and stevia in everything that you have. The other thing is because during the detox, people aren't having coffee. I find that that's usually the place that a lot of people will add their sweetener to. So if you're not having sweetener or you're not having coffee, then you're less likely to be using that. So I encourage yeah. people not to use it, but it is something that you can use on the detox if you wish. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I think that's something like if you're going to commit to doing a detox and because it is, you know, a short period of time, like two weeks, a week, two weeks, like you should be able to commit to, or hopefully commit to that time of, you know, taking the sweeteners out, like you said, to kind of resensitize your palate to that. And I think it's important to do that at times. And I do that too. Like I enjoy steep or monk fruit in my coffee pretty much every morning, but if I'm doing like an extended fast or something like that, like I'll take that out because having the goal of just, you know, flushing everything out, just resensitizing and doing it all at once. Like if I'm already putting in the hard work, I might as well just go that little bit of extra to, you know, do everything. Right. Yep. Um, I agree. So yeah. And then I had one other question. Oh, caffeine. So do you recommend, cause obviously going, first of all, going into a detox can be challenging, right? There's all these things that you have to, you know, change up and it's a challenge, right? But in terms of caffeine, that's another challenge on top of it, because we know that like, if you are used to having caffeine every single day, like it can be hard to just cut it out cold Turkey. Do you recommend like any kind of protocol of maybe before the detox starts going into it with like reducing your caffeine little by little, or do you have any recommendation for that? Yeah, it's a great question. Cause I actually had one of my clients in this current course do that. She really yeah. started weaning down before she started the detox because she was concerned. And so the headache symptoms and those kinds of things were lessened for her because she weaned off of it going into the detox. For people that consume a lot of coffee, those first couple of days of the detox can be really difficult in terms of having a caffeine withdrawal headache. Since I just detoxed, it was either in September or October, I already did this this fall, my caffeine withdrawal wasn't that bad because I intentionally was trying to not have it every single day so that I didn't get addicted to it again because it really is such an addicting addicting yeah. habit. And there's one part of the detox Rachel that I didn't recommend that I didn't mention before, which is you do that first week where you're having all of those yes foods and not any of the no foods. But the culmination of all of that is that you work up to a 24 hour fast. So the Monday, which is the day eight of the detox is a 24 hour fast. Now, the way I've traditionally done it and the way I'm having the course do it this time, especially for people that have never fasted before is rather than take all of the food and all of the drink and everything away from them for that day. What they're doing is they're going to be having water and then they have this cranberry juice, which is unsweetened, not from concentrate mixed with a ton of water okay. and some fresh spices and some other fresh juices. So that day is effectively a little bit of a juice cleanse, but it's water and juice and it's crayon designed, designed to really get all of the toxins out of your system. So you spend this whole week prepping your liver and prepping your colon and then you have one whole day where you're really releasing as much toxins as possible. And then you spend the rest of that second week adding back in all of those yes foods and mm -hmm. either the dairy in the form of yogurt or sauerkraut for people that are dairy sensitive. Okay. okay. It's really and to get that friendly bacteria back in. Gotcha. Gotcha. And with um, I'm, all these questions are popping up. So one thing I do want to mention is that when I've, um, you know, tried to cut out, cut out ca caffeine before I've tried the cold turkey and then I've tried like like starting with a week of just like minimizing it day by day. So instead of having like three cups of coffee, I'll go to two and then one, and then I'll switch to like green tea and kind of just like wean my way off of it. So that's, and I've done that with clients too. And I find that to be very helpful. So that might be even something, you know, like prep for the detox, you know, do that. Um, if in case anybody's listening and wants to like try it on their own, um, that might be a good idea just because it can, it, can, it can suck. If you are like a caffeine drinker, um, it can suck for sure. Um, and then my other question was, oh, cranberry. So can you just talk to how like, or why cranberry is really good for detox? 
Yes. So cranberry has a ton of health promoting benefits. There's research connected, connecting cranberries to cardiovascular benefits. Obviously, cranberry is a natural diuretic. It's why people probably know they've heard that when you have a bladder infection, you're supposed to drink cranberry juice because mm -hmm. it can flush toxins out. So the primary reason obviously is it's diuretic, but it also has a ton of other um, health benefits, largely cardiovascular. They've connected cranberry to um, prevention of certain cancers, which is really interesting. And so it's a really powerful, powerful fruit. Most people though on a low carb ketogenic diet aren't consuming it that much. So I feel like that's the other thing is you can get the benefit of all this amazing cranberry during the course of the two weeks. Um, gotcha. And I don't have them drink cranberry after day 11. So you're really only doing that intense cran juice. You're doing it on the day of the fast and every single day. In fact, in the water that I'm drinking right now, I'm drinking a little bit of cran with my okay. water. And do you just get, you just get unsweetened cranberry juice? From so I just buy unsweetened, not from concentrate, it's Lakewood organic. And so I'm only using eight ounces each day and I'm mixing that with 56 ounces of water. So it's really diluted because it's, it would be way too tart to drink on its own, yeah. but it's, it's fantastic for your health. And so that's why we're including it in the detox. And then the other thing is, and this is probably the most fascinating part of the detoxing, what I um, have recently learned, and now it makes more sense to me why I feel so good when I get done with these detox detoxes is our liver is actually a very emotional organ. So we store a ton of our emotions in our liver. So when our liver gets clogged up with gunk and all of the alcohol and processed food and stress and toxins from our skin and everything over the years, it actually can affect our moods. So one of the first things I notice after getting done with that fast day and getting through this cleanse is I'm always in a good mood. You don't have these like random bouts of kind of melancholiness. So I feel like in the middle of a quarantine, it's a really good time to do a detox. It just filters your whole system out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're convincing me to, to hop on this course. <laughs> well, and let me just talk a little bit about some of the liver and gallbladder stuff. Cause I think people don't recognize certain symptoms that might be associated with a sluggish liver. And so yeah, this comes from, about that. Yeah. yeah, so this comes from going back to nutritional therapy school and learning about this. So I, I find this fascinating. So here are things that are associated with sluggish liver and gallbladder. Um, pain between your shoulder blades. Your stomach is upset by greasy foods. You have greasy or shiny stools, nausea. You get motion sickness, which I think is really interesting. People always just say, oh, I'm just kind of one of those people that gets motion sickness. Well, you may have a clogged liver. Um, dry skin, itchy feet, or your skin peels on your feet. You are easily intoxicated if you drink wine. Um, these are just a bunch of examples. You have pain under your right side of your rib cage. You suffer from hemorrhoids or varicose veins. You have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. All of those things may be signs of an overtaxed liver. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that is. And so the same is true for if we look at the large intestine, and this is what I think a lot of people, again, have symptoms that they don't know what to attribute it to, but it may be that they simply need a detox. So this would be things like you have a coated tongue, you have chronic yeast infections, you have taken antibiotics over some period of time, you uh, have less than one bowel movement per day, you've had a history of parasites, you have irritable bowel or mucus colitis, you have um, bad smelling gas, you have bad breath or strong body odor, you have dark circles under your eyes. All of those are associated with a taxed large intestine. And again, people don't really connect these things to those particular organs. So they don't even realize they may need a detox. They might not even realize those symptoms are even happening in their body until they do a detox and they start to feel better. And so especially for people with low carb ketogenic diets, I always say, you guys, we do put a little more stress on our liver. We just do because our livers have to process a lot more fat. And so why not at least once a year say, okay, I'm going to do a full metabolic cleanup. I mean, there's nothing more metabolically flexible than yeah. this, right? To yeah. do this and say, I'm going to do this metabolic cleanup. I'm going to prove to myself that I can go on some like really low glycemic, good fiber carbs and proteins and lower fat for a while. And then I'm going to go back to my low carbohydrate diet. And I'm going to know that my liver and my colon are working that much better. And it makes your metabolism that much more efficient. So I think it's like one of the superpowers in terms of health. And I recommend that people practice it once a year for sure.
so cool. So cool to yeah. learn about like all these different things. Um, I did have, so we actually, we, so we kind of cut out from day eight. Like, I think we, we started talking about something else, but um, sure. can we just talk about like this, maybe just go into the second week a little bit. I know you talked a little bit about introducing um, more probiotic foods, but maybe we can chat a little bit about like what the second week in, entails and then like what you do afterwards. Like when you- finish. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the second week, so like I started this on a Monday, so I'll be fasting all day on the following Monday, this coming Monday, I'll fast all day. Okay. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I will still continue to drink some crayon water. But the main thing is I'm going to be having all of those yes foods again. And then I'm also, because you're trying to repopulate your small intestine with the good bacteria, you want your gut to have that diverse microbiome. So you're adding yogurt that has friendly bacteria or sauerkraut that has friendly bacteria. So you have all those live active cultures getting back into your system after you fasted for a day. But other than that, it's still the foods on the yes list. It's still the foods on the no list. And you continue that through the following Sunday. And then I always tell people when you're coming off of the detox, go slow. I have this horrible story about one of my girlfriends and I doing this once, probably like 10 or 15 years ago. And this was, this was before I was a low carb, um, proponent. And so we and a bunch of other girlfriends went to a movie and we got, this is literally the day we got done the detox. We got something like movie popcorn, m &Ms, I mean, <laughs> all of the kind of garbage food that I don't touch anymore, but we did that. And we were both so sick because we had just got done cleaning our body so well. She actually like, it's got so sick she threw up, which is terrible, but I'm saying go easy when you ease back into your normal carbohydrate diet, maybe titrate up in your fat and don't have a whole bolus of fat for the morning after you're done with your detox. And I always say, certainly don't go back to like a four shot Americano the next day yeah. or your liver is gonna scream at you. So really be gentle about caffeine. Maybe even that first week do caffeine every other day. Um, and so those are kind of my recommendations in terms of easing off. Okay, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, in terms of like exercise during the detox, what's, what's your kind of take on that? What do you recommend with that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because that's one of the things I haven't mentioned yet, which is detoxification is a parasympathetic process. So in order for our body to detox properly, we need to be in a parasympathetic state, which is of course our rest and digest state, as opposed to our sympathetic state, which is our fight or flight response. So I definitely still work out throughout the whole detox. Don't get me wrong. And I also listen to my body probably more than ever. So I don't recommend anything other than an easy walk on the fast day on day eight. But on the other days, like the first day of the detox, I ran in the morning seven miles because I knew that I'd still have energy from my regular diet. And then I did strength train on Tuesday. And I think I might, I took one of the days off this week. You notice for the first few days, you just feel a lot more tired. And it's because the detoxification pathways. So we have phase one and phase two detoxification pathways. And what that means is the phase one is a little more straightforward. So caffeine would be an example of a toxin that's cleared through our phase one detoxification pathway. Acetaminophen from like Tylenol or Excedrin, if people choose to take that, that's a far more complex compound. And those molecules are broken down and cleared through our de phase two detoxification pathways. And so the complicated nature of detox pathways that happen in our body just require us to be a little more relaxed and to sleep a little more. So I'm really intentional about my sleep when I start a detox. And I always tell people the first three days are the hardest. And by day four, you start to feel this surge of energy and everything gets better from there. So no joke, I have my best strength, strength training sessions, like my hardest lifts, probably from day four on through the detox, because I don't know how to explain it other than I feel like all this toxicity is out of my body. It's almost like if you think of a radio and you have static noise that interferes with it, mm -hmm. that's what I feel like is leaving my body. So I, I feel a lot stronger. I have a lot more focus and intention when I strength train and it really makes me feel like a superpower. Not the first few days though. So the first mm -hmm. day I slept 10 hours, the first, second day I slept nine hours, the third day I slept seven and a half hours and then I had to take a nap. So it really, you do get tired the yeah. first few days. Now I'm, I'm over that hump now, but I always tell people to really pay attention. If you need to nap, nap. If you need to sleep, sleep. It's your body actually working on detoxifying. And so you need to give it the time and space to actually be able to do that so that it can do it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then another question popped up when you're talking about acetaminophen in terms of supplements and like medication, if someone is taking regular supplements or taking a regular medication that maybe they, they can't stop taking, like, what would you recommend with that? So because of my, it would be out of my scope of practice to tell people not to take their pharmaceuticals. So obviously I can't do that. So I say, whatever pharmaceutical medication you're taking that's been you know, prescribed by your doctor that you have to take, continue to take that unless you consult with your doctor and your doctor says it's fine to not. So I can't really interfere with that. As far as supplements, it depends on the person, but for the most part, at least during all of the days other than day eight, which is the fast day, you can continue to take your supplements. But again, I take such high quality supplements that those would be the only things I would allow. So there's so many supplements that people take that they don't realize have all sorts of unnecessary fillers, have stuff that it's tough for your body to break down. So if, unless I know that what they're taking is minimal high quality stuff, I usually tell them for these two weeks, if they could consider going off of their supplements just to allow their body to actually be able to detox properly, that would be best. In fact, Rachel, I have a pathologist as a client and she has told me it is horrifying sometimes when they open people up to see the amount of pill casings and stuff inside them because their bodies don't break them down. So this is why I tell people you have to be using, if you're going to take supplements, it has to be high quality stuff because our body just isn't designed to break down a lot of what the garbage is that you see in big box retailers. I just don't buy anything there. It really is, is I mean, it, yeah. it can be toxic for your system just to take a supplement that isn't high quality. So the quality supplements I take either don't have a shell or capsule, they're just a tablet, or the capsule is literally made from just one ingredient that's a vegetable cellulose that's food that your body uses anyways. Wow. I had no idea that like you, like people, cause I thought that if you didn't, like if your body didn't process that, that you would just like poop it out. Right. But is that not... <laughs> So, so I do, I do think that probably eventually over time, your body finally will break that stuff down, but presumably, yeah. and I should have asked her more details about the particular patient she was talking about, but presumably it could be someone older who's on a ton of pills. And it's like, yeah. your body just can't, a lot of those capsules aren't able to be digested easily. Mm -hmm. And so, especially if you think of all of these Americans that are walking around with all these digestive problems, and I'm going to say it again, because they have probably have an overclogged liver or they have a colon that isn't working right. And that stuff, those toxins, if your colon is not working properly, the toxins in your colon can back up and get reabsorbed by your liver. I mean, it's, it's, so I just think in order to really optimize your health and optimize your metabolism, everyone should consider doing a detox, see how you feel, see how good you feel at the end of it. And then you'll realize, okay, this is something I really want to commit to every year. I've had years over the past 20 years of doing this where I've done four detoxes a year, just because I felt like I just like how I feel. And I like that it gets me, I don't know about you, but I can get in this habit sometimes and I'm just going to pick on Quest because I love them, but I can get in this habit of, oh, I'm just going to have a Quest bar. Oh, next day, I'm going to have a Quest bar. I'm going to, yeah. so, so my thing is it's, it's like, it forces me to get back into eating real food. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so I did I keep questions, keep popping up. Um, <laughs> fasting. Oh, I wanted to ask about fasting. So I did mention in the beginning, like kind of my form of, I guess, detoxing or like resetting or whatever you want to call it, giving my body, my digestive system break has been just doing some like a yearly extended fast. Um, what is kind of your take on, because I know that could probably be like a stress as a liver. Um, but in terms of like, you know, doing a, a detox protocol versus maybe just doing like a three day water fast, maybe like bone broth fast or just water, like what's kind of your take? Cause I know you've done extended fast in the past. So like, what's your take on that in terms of, um, you know, how they, I guess, compare to each other or. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome because I do do both. So I recommend both and I think they're very different and here's why coming back to the fact that, that actual real detoxification that supports our phase one and phase two detoxification pathways that supports our liver, that heals our liver and that supports our colon. The fact that those things need to happen in a parasympathetic state, I think is inconsistent with the extended fasting. Now I love extended fasting and I do it. And I just think that the purpose of it is different. Obviously with the extended fast, my goal is to create cellular autophagy my goal is to create 
um, a lot of anti-aging benefits from that cellular autophagy to create metabolic benefits to, I always say, remove my emotional distortions around food. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of reasons I do extended fasting. That's one of them. And I think going through a more real food, nutritious, supportive detox is, a, is probably like the other side of the coin. It's also good for anti-aging. It's good for cleaning out your system, but it's really like a metabolic reset in terms of filtering out the gunk that is in your liver and that is in your colon. I can't cite a research article for you, Rachel, on this, but I have to imagine even with extended fasting, just because it can be more of a stressor on your system and more of a sympathetic process, that it's not going to give you the same benefit that a real food detox is. I mean, for example, I get reports from clients all the times, all the time in my detox course about how drastically different their bowel movements are just even a few days in. So those things change pretty dramatically because many people, and this is sick, but it's real, have a lot of gunked up old fecal matter on the walls of their colon that doesn't get flushed out properly. And so by consuming all of the yes foods on this detox that really get strong amounts of fiber into your system that clean and scrub, the fiber that's in this detox really helps to scrub the walls of your colon that it actually gets all of that old stuff out. And I don't know that you get the same benefit from an extended fast. Mm -hmm. I think extended fasting has a host of benefits. I just think those are very different protocols and I do recommend both of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes, it makes total sense. Like when you said, you know, being in that parasympathetic versus sympathetic state. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I even think about that. So, And sense. for example, like today, I ended up just because of my schedule I ended up fasting for over 16 hours before I had my first meal. And for someone who hasn't detoxed before, I wouldn't recommend that, but obviously you and I are practice fasters, so we can do more intermittent fasting for a long time. And I remember reflecting on it because I thought it was funny that we had this interview today. I thought this is literally the ultimate test in metabolic flexibility. Here I had a dinner last night that had tons of vegetable carbs, Brussels sprouts, carrots, apples, all sorts of things and lean proteins. I had salmon. It was an awesome dinner. I was done eating before seven. And then I didn't eat until close to noon today, or it was about noon. And I thought the fact that I could do that means because I'm metabolically flexible, my body was able to tap into the other stores and I didn't feel it. I wasn't hangry at 9am. You know, I wasn't hangry at 7am. I could, I could continue throughout my morning because I've achieved that ultimate state of metabolic flexibility, which I'm so grateful for. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like one of the biggest things that I always talk about with metabolic flexibility is like, it's your body can literally go back and forth between these fuel sources. And the more flexible you get, the more, the easier it gets. And I mean, exactly what you said, that just talks exactly to what I always chat about on this podcast. Right. Um, so super cool. And it's um, so fun. Cause I know you've been getting the word out about it a ton and it's so huge. And it's something that most people still don't understand. You know, I always tell my clients, I'm like, you walk around in the world and most people are running on glucose and carbs all day long and they don't realize when they become hangry, that's what the problem is. And so your body, like you owe it to your body to teach it how to burn fat for fuel so that you can go back and forth between fuel sources. Cause it's, it's so powerful to be able to do it. Exactly. I love that. That's, we, we take, usually take quotes out of the podcast, like to feature them. And I'm definitely, literally the sentence you just said is going to be the quote. <laughs> so was, I, I love it. it. Um, Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I just learned so much um, about all things detoxing, which I am really, really glad that, that I was able to have you on, but do you want to, before we end, well, first of all, I have a, one more question for you, with, which I've asked you before. I think it's the, the question that I usually end with, but before I do that, can you just um, tell us like what the, your detox protocol is called and like where people can go to, to find it. Yes. So I would say that m most of my, um, most of the protocol strategy that I use around detoxing comes from a few different books. I rely pretty heavily on practices that Anne Louise Gittleman has come up with. She came up with the fat flush plan probably in 2000. And then a handful of years later, maybe even 10 years later, she came out with this one day detox diet. And so a lot of the yes foods and no foods that I rely on are in there. And then I've changed the protocols somewhat to incorporate even more fiber and more vegetables. And I've allowed for additional fats. And of course, because these books came out 10 and 20 years ago, the science has updated a fair amount, mm -hmm. right? So 
it's it's no longer a no-no to say we can't have it's no longer a no-no to include coconut oil right or you can have more things like that that weren't really approved of back then so i've modified things to to catch up with the updated science but Anne louise gittleman she also came out with a recent book that i read again called radical metabolism and she speaks to some of this in her book radical metabolism and i thought that was a really good book so i do recommend that to anyone who's interested in learning more okay cool awesome i'll link those in the show notes um okay so my last question is <clears throat> is there anything that you've changed your mind about in the last year and why i know i'm putting you on the spot here so take yes <laughs> Okay, so in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, and I'll just keep it focused on nutrition because that's what we are both into. I'd say the biggest thing is I've changed my mind about that you have to be sort of one thing all the time. If there's anything that I've really come to appreciate in the last year, it is, and I've done, like I said, these detoxes for many years, but I don't think I had as much of an appreciation for the fact that you can do something for months at a time, get a lot of benefit from it. And then you actually can take a break and do something else and still get a number of benefits. They just might be different benefits. So, you know, I used to think I had to go strict therapeutic keto or strict high protein bodybuilding diet or strict this or strict that. And those are the only ways to lose weight. But it turns out here, I'm doing this two week detox. And when I did it a few weeks ago, I saw my lowest weight on the scale that I had seen in years. And it was after doing two weeks of you know, 30 or more percent of my calories from carbs. Who would have thought that? But it's because I changed it up and I did this two week break and I cleaned out my liver, I cleaned up my colon. Many people are holding on to extra pounds in their body that sit in their colon. So even just doing that and getting rid of that excess weight, I, all of the people that go through this detox experience weight loss, improve skin, improve focus, better moods. I mean, there's just no reason not to do it really. Yeah. So I'd say if there's one thing I've changed my mind about, it's just this myopic focus on having to be keto or having to be paleo or having to be high protein, or, you know, you really can do all of the things. I just say it's the intention that you come back to. What is your intention and do an experiment for 30 days or 60 days or three months with something and then do something else and see what works yeah. best for you. And it's okay to change. It's okay. I love that. And that's literally what my personal definition of metabolic flexibility is, right? Not living on the extremes of the spectrum, but being able to go, you know, back and forth between it and try new things out because we're all changing. Like everything's changing in our lives, you know, month to month, year to year with our exercise, like with just how we're evolving as people with our stress levels, like all of those things contribute to like kind of the different areas we are, we're at in our lives and your nutrition changes too. Right. So I think it's super important to be able to, you know, try out new things and, you know, we're recording this around the holidays, like going into the holidays, being able to maybe have a little bit extra carbs and not feel super guilty about it mm -hmm. or, you know, trying out carnivore, trying out a detox or something like that. Like just, you know, teaching your body to be okay with these different things. And the more you kind of expose yourself to these different ways of doing things, and the more exposure you give yourself to, to, to these different concepts and things, the more resilient you become, right? And that's kind of what this like whole concept of metabolic flexibility is like, teach your body to become more resilient. It's like that exposure therapy thing, right? Like expose yourself to these things and you'll be more resilient down the line. Um, so yeah, and also the concept of, and this is something I've been talking about a lot, is just getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? Like mm -hmm. detoxing is not like comfortable, right? Going from a high carb to a low carb or a keto diet is not comfortable. Doing the opposite, it's not comfortable, but you're building that resilience and you're like building those things up. And the next time you do it, it's going to be easier. So. Right, right. Yeah. What is that saying? It's like, it reminded me of <clears throat> a comfort zone is a nice place to be, but nothing ever grows there, right? Exactly. And exactly. it's so true. It's like, I always say, if you could just, and I do this with my clients all the time, push them out of their comfort zone. The number of my clients that are like, oh my gosh, I made a meatloaf. I never would have made meatloaf before, but they did because I told them that's what they were going to make. I gave yeah. them a recipe, you know, and it's just all of that stuff that you just try something for the first time and lo and behold, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, before you go, before we go, do you want to just tell everybody where they can find you, like your website, social media, all that jazz? 
Yes. So website is energeticallyefficient.com. I'm currently going through sort of a refresh with that. So hopefully that will come out relatively soon. My Instagram handle is mngoldengirl. And then um, I'm Kristen Rowell on LinkedIn, Kristen Rowell on Facebook. So those are probably the best ways to find me. But my email is Kristen at energeticallyefficient.com. Awesome. Awesome. And I always, I always say this, but I love, love your name, energetic, energetically efficient. Thank you. It's like the best. It's like my favorite brand name that. Thank you. Like, I wish and it, it came to me in a meditation. Came I to know. me in meditation. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. All right. Well, I will link, I'll link all those in the show notes. So anybody who's listening or watching can check that, check that out. Um, your website, all that jazz. Perfect. Um, Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Well, this was fun. Uh, I was excited to kind of catch up and chat all about detoxing. And next time, I'm sure I'll have you back on. Next time, maybe we'll have a, another topic or maybe we'll have some questions from people about detoxing. Perfect. Maybe we'll do like a part two or something. So. I'd love to do a Q&A if people are interested. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Okay. Sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Bye.